Little Women, Chapter One, A Christmas Letter. Christmas won't be Christmas without any presents," grumbled Jo March, lying on the rug. "I hate being poor," sighed her sister Meg, looking at her old dress. "So do I," sniffed Amy, the youngest, who was gazing at the passersby. "And I don't think it's fair for some girls to have a lot of pretty things and the other girls nothing at all." At least we have father and mother and each other," said Beth. "We don't have father," Joe observed, moving to the sofa. "Not for a long time, perhaps never." Each sister added silently to herself, thinking of their father far away at the war. "Mother said we ought not to have presents this Christmas anyway," announced Meg. "She thinks it's wrong to spend money for fun when our men are suffering in the army." At sixteen, the eldest, Meg, did her best to sound grown up, but she did, didn't always succeed. Mother wouldn't want us to give up everything," cried Joe. "And we each have a dollar. We could spend it on ourselves. I'm going to buy a book. I'm buying drawing paper," decided Amy. Beth began playing the old piano, skipping over the parts with, where the notes were missing. A new piano is too expensive. She said quietly, "But I'd love more music." We deserve some fun," Joe added. "I suffer, er, I suffer enough every day looking after Great Aunt March with her fuzzy old woman ways." It can't be as bad as my job teaching those horrible children," Mac complained. "I hate having to work." "My life is worse," Amy butted in. All the girls at school laugh at me because of my patched clothes. Beth put out her mother's old slippers to warm by the fire. They were full of holes. Let's not get anything for ourselves, she said. Let's buy presents for mother instead. She works so hard. Joe beamed. That's a much better idea. We'll go shopping tomorrow. And seizing Beth, she danced around the room. Mac and Amy clapped and cheered them on. As the bear collapsed in an exhaust heap, they heard the front door open. Mother was home. I'm glad to find you so merry, girls," she smiled, coming in a few moments later. "I'm sorry I'm late. There was so much fun to do, sending foods and clothes to our soldiers. But I have a treat: a letter from father." Excitedly, they drew near the fire. Their mother sat in the big chair, and Joe perched by her feet. She rested in her chin in her hand, ready to shield her face and hide any tears that might fall. Father's letter was cheerful and full of hope. It seems a long time to wait before I see you again. Give the girls my love. I know they'll be loving children, that they'll work hard and conquer their faults, so that when I return, I'll be fonder and prouder than ever of my little women. Little Women, Chapter Two: The Lawrence Boy. After Christmas, everyone felt miserable. Nothing nice ever happened to us," moaned Amy. "That's not true," said Joe, coming into the room and tripping over Beth's cat. In her fall, she knocked ink into Max's hat, leaving a dark, spreading stain. "Oh, it's ruined!" snapped Meg. "And I can't afford another. You're so clumsy, Joe." Beth, can you keep that cat of yours under control? Joe struggled her shoulders. Was there even such a cross family? But just wait. One day I'll be writing books and plays and be so rich that I can buy stacks of hats. Beth can have all the cats in the world and a new piano. Meg, Joe, their mother called, coming in front of the hall. This will cheer you up. A party invitation for a New Year's Eve dance tomorrow. If only I had a silk dress and curled hair," sighed Meg. "Your dress is fine," said Joe. "My party dress is so scorched when I stood too near the fire, and my gloves have lemonade all over them." "You can't wear them then," said Meg firmly. "We'll each wear one of my good gloves and hold one of yours." And you must keep your bag outside of your seat. 
I think I'm going to hate this party, Joe muttered. Amy stuck on her bottom lip. At least you're going. I wish I could. I'm glad I'm not, murmured Beth. But I'm sure it'll be better than you think. She whispered to Joe. The next evening, Joe helped Meg get ready, holding red hot curling tongs to her hair. But soon she was thinking about her latest idea for a story, and a minute later she smelled burning. To Meg's horror, a roll of scorched curls fell onto her lap. Oh, I can't do anything right," said Joe, flinging down the tongs in a disgust and rushing to out of the room. Amy ran to the console. Meg, there," she said, fixing a velvet bow to Meg's hair. Now it knows Joe. As soon as they arrived at the party, Meg began dancing with her friends. Joe, who was terrified of showing Meg up, shot behind a curtain. To her surprise, she found a boy already there. "You're Mr. Lawrence's grandson," she blurted out. "I've seen you before. You live next door to us." The boy nodded. "Hello." He said, "I'm Laurie. I'm hiding because I hardly know anyone here." "You know me now," said Joe with a grin. "I'm hiding because of my dress," she confessed, showing him the burn. Laurie laughed. "Let's dance a polka down the passage, where no one will see us," he suggested. After their dance, Laurie went to get ice creams, which they devoured behind the curtain. By the time the party ended, they were firm friends. They were laughing in a corner when Meg lived over to them. These wretched shoes, she groaned. I think I've sprained my ankle. Would you like a lift in my carriage? Laurie offered. If it won't be too much trouble, said Meg. Yes, please. Mrs. March was still up when they arrived home, waiting to hear about the party. When she saw Meg, she fussed around her like a mother hen. We came back with Mr. Lawrence's grandson, she said, as Mrs. March bandaged Meg's ankle. He's an orphan, their mother told them. He's only just moved in with his grandfather. I must say he looks like a nice young man with excellent manners. Meg hobbled to stairs, thinking about the evening. I felt like a fine young lady. Dancing and coming home by carriage, I don't believe real life, real fine young ladies, could have enjoyed themselves more than us. In spite of our burnt hair, scorched grounds, and only one good glove each, declared Joe. Little Women, Chapter Three, Amy's Crime. One morning, Meg came down to find Amy sobbing her heart over the kitchen table. I'm dreadfully in debt," Amy wept. "What do you mean?" asked Meg. Amy sniffed. "I owe a dozen pickled limes at school. They are all the fashion. The girls keep buying them and eat theirs, and now I must pay them back. But I don't have any money." "How much do you need?" said Meg, opening her purse. "Oh, thank you, Mark, darling," Amy cried, hugging her. "I'll buy them on the way to school." She didn't tell Meg that limes have been forbidden. The news that Amy had limes soon spread. As the class began, a girl who disliked Amy shot up her hand. "Please, sir, Amy March has his limes in her desk." The teacher was furious. He made Amy throw her the plump limes out of the window one by one. Then he caned her hands in front of the entire class. You won't go back," their mother comforted Amy that night. "That school is full of spoiled, badly brought-up children. Still, it was your fault too. You did break the rules." "I, I had to." Amy couldn't stop crying. It was so humiliating not having any pickled limes. "I'll teach you at home instead," Joe offered later, picking up her head as she spoke. "Thank you." Amy gulped. "Where are you going, Joe? To see a play with Laurie? Take me with you," begged Amy. "No," said Joe firmly. "You're too young." "Oh, please," Amy waited. "No, you'll be sorry, Joe March," 
Amy yelled at her. And I just offered to teach you, Joe yelled back. Spoiled brat, she added, slamming the door on the way her out. When Joe came back from the play, she started looking for her notebook. With panic in her voice, she asked if anyone had seen it. Beth, Meg, Amy, do you know where it is? The blue one with all my stories in it. Everyone shook their heads, but Amy blushed a guilty red. Amy, you've got it! Cried Joe. No, I haven't. I burned it. Burned. The whole family knew how precious that book was. Joe had worked on it for months, hoping some of the stories might even be good enough to print. Joe shook Amy until her teeth chattered together, crying passionately. "You wicked girl! I could never write those stories again. I'll never forget you." Beth flew to comfort Joe while Max scolded Amy. "I feel dreadful," Amy said at that time. Please forgive me, Joe. I'm very, very sorry. I'll never forgive you," Joe repeated. "It was an abominable, abominable thing to do." Amy turned away. "Now I wish I hadn't said sorry," she said. She snapped, "And I'm not so there." The next morning, Joe was still furious about her notebook. Waiting, wanted to get out of the house. She asked Laurie to go skating with her. Amy watched them leave from her bedroom window. Bother, she thought. Joe promised to take me skating next time, but she's too cross. Well, I'll just go anyway. When Amy arrived, Joe and Laurie were already zigzagging down the river. Keep to the side," Laurie called to Joe. "The ice is getting too thin in the middle." Amy, far behind, didn't hear. Joe looked back and saw Amy coming after them. She can take care of herself, mean pig," she thought angrily. Amy aimed straight for the middle, but Joe skated on, with a strange feeling inside her. There was sudden a scream and the terrible sound of cracking ice. Joe spun around. Amy had vanished. Only her hood could be seen bobbing in the water. Grab a branch, Laurie shouted. For a second, Joe stood frozen with terror. Before she pulled herself together, she spread off and turned with a strong branch to find Laurie lying on the ice, just separately clutching one of Amy's hands. Joe thrust the far end of the branch into Amy's reach and helped to pull her, gasping and coughing from the freezing water. Joe hugged Amy tight, swiftly taking off her dripping things and wrapping her warmly in her own dry clothes. Suppose she drowned, Joe agonized, after she and their mother had tucked Amy into bed. Sometimes I get too angry. I lose control. I wish I didn't. I used to be just like you," Mrs. March conf- confided. "Don't worry, Joe. I'll still get angry too, but I'll try not to show it. If you keep trying, you'll conquer yourself, anger." Her mother's quiet sympathy and understanding helped Joe more than any scolding could have done. Little Women, Chapter Four, Party Girl. That summer, Meg was invited to stay with her friend Sally Moffat. If only I didn't have to work, she grumbled. Then, at the last minute, the children she looked after caught measles. I can go after all, Meg realized excitedly. Her sisters helped her pack. A whole week of fun, Beth said, picking out a hair ribbons f- for Meg to take. Amy was green with envy. Ooh, I wish I was going to a house party. Joe began to fold, to fold Meg's skirts, looking like a windmill with her long arms. What did Mother give you out of the treasure chest? She wanted to know. The treasure chest, made of sweet-smelling cedar wood, 
was where their mother keep their best things. A pretty fan, a blue sash, and a pair of silk stockings," said Meg. "There was a length of violet silk too, but there isn't time to have it made up into a dress, so I must be content with my old white cotton, I suppose," she sighed. "Never mind, you always look lovely in white," Beth consoled her. "I wish I hadn't smashed my coral bracelet; it would have stilted you too." Mourned Joe, who loved to lend her things, though they were usually too broken or to be much of use. My white isn't low-necked and it doesn't rustle like a silk dress, Max said crossly. But it will have to do because there isn't anything else. You said the other day you'd be perfectly happy if you could only go to Sally Moffat's, Beth reminded her. Beth gave a real, a real full laugh. So I did. I suppose the more you have, the more you want. Meg was overawed by the Moffat stylish and enormous house. She loved eating their extravagant meals, riding in their carriages, and dressing herself up every day to go shopping and go to the concerts and on elegant picnics. Sally Moffat's pretty things filled her with envy, and home soon seemed bare and dull by comparison. The house was full of Sally's friends, all the girls the same age, but not one of them earned a living like Meg. She began to copy their airs and graces, and to feel ill-used and overworked. The highlight of the week was the spring ball. The girls spend their time chatting about which dresses to wear. I have a new pink silk, Sally said. What are you wearing, Meg? My old white, said Meg, blushing. Let me see, everyone begged. As Meg displayed it, as Meg displayed it, there was a stunned silence. Meg felt them pity her poverty. Waves of bitterness swept over her as the others showed off their beautiful ball dresses, which billowed like clouds of glossy butterflies. "You can't wear the white; it's a day dress," Sally said. That at last, I know. We'll dress you up. She called her French maid, and between them, they transformed Mag. They powdered her neck and arms, rubbed her with scent, rushed her neck, her cheeks. Painted her lips and crimped her hair. Then they laced her into a blue silk dress so tight Meg gasped for breath. The dress left her shoulders bare and the front was cut low. Finally, they decked her out like a Christmas tree, with bracelets, brooch, necklace, and earrings. They even tucked a silver butterfly in her hair. Beautiful," said Sally. But something had fled out of Meg. Her simplic, his simplicity and freshness had disappeared into their place with a frilled, freshen, fashioned doll, no different from any of the other girls. Meg felt strange but excited as she te- teetered downstairs to the ball in her borrowed, high-heeled, blue silk shoes. "Don't trip," giggled Sally. To her delight, Meg found that the fashionable guests in the house party, who had ignored her in her shabby clothes, now swarmed to her like bees to honey. She loved being so popular and drank glasses after glasses of champagne. She was flirting over the fan when she saw Laurie coming up to her. Meg, what have you done? Meg fluttered her eyelashes. It's the new Meg. Don't you like her? Not a bit," said Laurie gravely. "I don't like dressed-up girls. And what would Joe say if she saw you?" Just then, they heard they heard people talking behind them. Mrs. March had laid her plans. She keeps trying to pair off one of her girls with the rich Lawrence boy. Those Marches haven't a penny to their name. 
It will be a fine match for them. Look at that girl; she knows how to play her cards. Meg went pale under her ground cheeks, under her rouged cheeks. How dare they! It's not true. Don't listen, Meg. It's just silly gossip," Laurie whispered. "Don't tell Mother and the other girls about this," Meg begged Laurie. "I'd rather tell them myself." "I won't," he promised. "But I don't drink any more champagne," he added in a brotherly way. "You'll have a li- little splitting headache tomorrow." Back at home, Meg told her mother everything. "I let them make a fool of me." And I flirted and behaved so badly, I just couldn't help myself. It is so nice to be praised and admired. Of course it is," said her mother. "But be careful of your love, and praise doesn't make you do silly things. Enjoy yourself, but be modest as well, Meg. Blushing, Meg described the gossip, and she'd overheard. Mother, do you have plans for us? Mrs. March stalked her girl, stroked her gr- daughter's anxious face. Meg, my only plan is for you to marry for love. If you are happy, I wouldn't mind if you marry a poor man or didn't even marry. Sally says a poor girl has no luck. Meg said, "Sally's wrong," said her mother firmly. "Be yourself, Meg, good and kind, and leave the rest to time." Max smiled at her mother. Home may not be rich or splendid, but it's the best place in the world. Little Women, Chapter Four, Party Girl. That summer, Meg was invited to stay with her friend Sally Moffat. If only I didn't have to work, she grumbled. Then, at the last minute. The children she looked after caught measles. I can go after all," Meg realized excitedly. Her sisters helped her pack. A whole week of fun," Beth said, picking out a hair ribbons f- for Meg to take. Amy was green with envy. "Ooh, I wish I was going to a house party." Joe began to told to fold Meg's skirts. Looking like a windmill with her long arms. What did Mother give you out of the treasure chest? She wanted to know. The treasure chest, made of sweet-smelling cedar wood, was where their mother kept their best things. A pretty fan, a blue sash, and a pair of silk stockings," said Meg. There was a length of violet silk too, but there isn't time to have it made up into a dress. So I must be content with my old white cotton, I suppose," she sighed. "Never mind. You always look lovely in white," Beth consoled her. "I wish I hadn't smashed my coral bracelet. It would have stilled you too," mourned Joe, who loved to lend her things, though they were usually too broken or to be much of use. My white isn't low-necked and it doesn't rustle like a silk dress," Max said crossly. "But it will have to do because there isn't anything else. You said the other day you'd be perfectly happy if you could only go to Sally Moffat's," Beth reminded her. Beth gave a real, a real full laugh. "So I did. I suppose the more you have, the more you want." Meg was overawed by the Moffat's stylish and enormous house. She loved eating their extravagant meals, riding in their carriages, and dressing herself up every day to go shopping and go to the concerts and on elegant picnics. Sally Moffat's pretty things filled her with envy, and home soon seemed bare and dull by comparison. The house was f- full of Sally's friends, all the girls the same age, but not one of them earned a living like Meg. She began to copy their airs and graces, and to feel ill-used and overworked. 
The highlight of the week was the spring ball. The girls spend their time chatting about which dresses to wear. I have a new pink silk, Sally said. What are you wearing, Meg? My old white, said Meg, blushing. Let me see, everyone begged. As Meg displayed it, as Meg displayed it, there was a stunned silence. Meg felt them pity her poverty. Waves of bitterness swept over her as the others showed off their beautiful ball dresses, which billowed like clouds of gauzy butterflies. "You can't wear the white; it's a day dress," Sally said. That at last, I know. We'll dress you up. She called her French maid, and between them, they transformed Mag. They powdered her neck and arms, rubbed her with scent, rushed her neck, her cheeks. Painted her lips and crimped her hair. Then they laced her into a blue silk dress so tight Meg gasped for breath. The dress left her shoulders bare and the front was cut low. Finally, they decked her out like a Christmas tree, with bracelets, brooch, necklace, and earrings. They even tucked a silver butterfly in her hair. Beautiful," said Sally. But something had fled out of Meg. Her simplic, his simplicity and freshness had disappeared into their place with a frilled, fashion, fashioned doll, no different from any of the other girls. Meg felt strange but excited as she te- teetered downstairs to the ball in her borrowed, high-heeled, blue silk shoes. "Don't trip," giggled Sally. To her delight, Meg found that the fashionable guests in the house party, who had ignored her in her shabby clothes, now swarmed to her like bees to honey. She loved being so popular and drank glasses after glasses of champagne. She was flirting over the fan when she saw Laurie coming up to her. Meg, what have you done? Meg fluttered her eyelashes. It's the new Meg. Don't you like her? Not a bit," said Laurie gravely. "I don't like dressed-up girls. And what would Joe say if she saw you?" Just then, they heard they heard people talking behind them. Mrs. March had laid her plans. She keeps trying to pair off one of her girls with the rich Lawrence boy. Those Marches haven't a penny to their name. It would be a fine match for them. Look at that girl; she knows how to play her cards. Meg went pale under her ground cheeks, under her rouged cheeks. How dare they! It's not true. Don't listen, Meg. It's just silly gossip," Laurie whispered. "Don't tell Mother and the other girls about this," Meg begged Laurie. "I'd rather tell them myself." "I won't," he promised. But I don't drink any more champagne," he added in a brotherly way. "You have a li- little splitting headache tomorrow." Back at home, Mac told her mother everything. "I let them make a fool of me, and I flirted and behaved so badly. I just couldn't help myself. It is so nice to be praised and admired." "Of course it is," said her mother. But be careful of your love, and praise doesn't make you do silly things. Enjoy yourself, but be modest as well, Meg. Blushing, Meg described the gossip, and she'd overheard. Mother, do you have plans for us? Mrs. March stroked her girl, stroked her gr- daughter's anxious face. Meg, my only plan is for you to marry for love. If you were happy, I wouldn't mind if you marry a poor man or didn't even marry. Sally says a poor girl has no luck. Meg said, "Sally's wrong," said her mother firmly. "Be yourself, Meg, good and kind, and leave the rest to time." Meg smiled at her mother. Home may not be rich or splendid, but it's the best place in the world. Little Women, Chapter Five.
shocking news. When Laurie went on outings with the March girls, he often brought her tutor along. John Brooke was a thoughtful man with friendly brown eyes and a gentle presence. Have you seen how Brooke looks at Meg? Laurie asked Joe one afternoon. Meg wouldn't dream of love- falling in love with him," snapped Joe. "She's tired of flirting and men. Come on, let's go to the post office. I want to see if there's a new story magazine out." There was. Laurie and Joe brought it home. Joe flung herself down and read as if she were gobbling it up. "Read it aloud," urged Meg. "We haven't heard a new story for ages." Brilliant. Was the general opinion when Joe finished? Who wrote it? Asked Amy, with an odd mix of solemnity and excitement in her voice. Joe replied, "Your sister." Beth flung her arms around Joe. "Oh, you're so clever." The magazine editor paid me for this one, and he asked me for more stories. I'll be able to help us all. Mrs. March gazed at Joe fondly. "Your father will be so proud," she said. A sharp ring at the door interrupted them. There was a telegraph boy bearing a telegram with a stark introduction. "To Mrs. March, your husband is very ill. Come at once, Doctor Hill, Washington Hospital." Instantly, the whole world seemed to change. As the happy atmosphere collapsed around them, Mrs. Marsh rose shakily to start packing. Laurie and Joe rushed from the house. Beth hugged her cat tightly, while Amy simply stood still as a statue. Laurie returned with John Brooke. Would your mother like me to escort here? He asked Meg. It's a difficult journey, and the war makes it even harder to, for women to travel alone. Meg was full of gratitude. That's so kind, Joan. Grandfather sent these to help the in- invalid," said Laurie, squeezing some bottles of brandy into their mother's luggage, along with a worn dressing gown, bandages, and a blanket. Jo raced in excitedly, her bonnet tied tightly under her chin, and handed a purse full of money to her mother. Aunt March said this. She said father was stupid to go to war when he was so old. She knew no good would come of it, and she hoped that you'd take her advice next time. Mrs. March tightened her lips, and Joe guessed that she was trying to keep her temper, but her mother only said, "Take off your bonnet, Joe." Joe pulled it off, and a cry rose from her family. Her beautiful long chestnut hair has been cut as short as boys. What have you done? Gasped Amy. I sold it, Joe said proudly. I saw tails of hair for sale in the barber's window, so I asked them to cut mine off to get more money for father. Mrs. March was overwhelmed. Oh, Joe, you shouldn't have. Nonsense. It will do my brain brains good to have that the mob taken off. Besides, I'll be ballish and easy to keep tidy. Amy thinked her her own ringlets. How could you? She asked. She doesn't look like Joe any more, but I love her for it. Beth said softly. Little Women, Chapter Six, Beth. Mrs. March left for Washington at once. A week later, they heard from the Mr. Brooke that father was recovering. The news made everyone feel happier. Meg and Jo worked hard at their jobs. Beth and Amy cleaned the house, and they shared the cooking. But one by one, they slipped back into their old ways. Meg spent hours reading John Brooke's letters. Jo curled up with her writing, and Amy went back to sketching. Only Beth faithfully carried out their mother, their mother's duties, taking food to families in the poorer part of town. One afternoon, she was drenched 
in a downpour of icy winter sleet. When she got home, the fire was out and she couldn't get warm. A few days later, Beth started shivering as though she'd never stop. At the same time, she felt boiling hot. Jo found her looking in the medicine cupboard. "I don't feel well," Beth muttered, going to press her burning head against the cold window pane. Jo felt Beth's forehead and was horrified. "Beth, you're feverish. We must get the doctor." When the doctor came, he looked serious. "The child has scarlet fever." He announced, and sent her straight to bed. Beth grew worse and worse. Amy was sent to stay with Aunt Marge to keep her out of the way, and Meg continued to work, th- work though both of them longed to be at home. Jo spent all her time nursing her sister. A bitter wind raged and snow fell. It lay in drifts, drifts around the garden, as white as Beth's face. During the restless, anxious hours in Beth's room, Jo realized how much she loved her. Beth's shyness means she was the quiet, quietest of the sisters, but her kindness and gentleness made her all the most precious. All of them had ambitions except Beth. Meg wanted to marry. Jo was determined to be an author, and Amy dreamed. Of being an artist, Beth just wanted to make people happy. One afternoon, Laurie caught Joe having a private cry. I wish I had. I wish I didn't have a heart. It 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 aches so. She sobbed. Laurie's eyes were wet too as she comforted her. We mustn't give up hope. That won't help Beth. I've sent a telegram to your mother," he added. "I think she could come soon." Their mother came as soon as he could, brightness and courage shining from her. That night, Beth's fever broke. The doctor confirmed it. "She's still weak," he said, "but I think she she'll pull through." Little Women, Chapter Six, Endings and Beginnings. Like sunshine after a storm, several peaceful weeks followed. In Washington, Mr. March was getting stronger every day, and Beth was soon well enough to come downstairs and lie on the study sofa. Christmas Day dawned mild and sunny. Laurie ran in and out with parents, and Joe made ridiculous speeches as she as she presented each one. I'm so full of happiness that if only father were here. I could, I couldn't hold one more drop," sighed Beth. "So am I," agreed Joe, gloating over one of her presents, a brand new novel. "And me," echoed Amy, looking at a delicate framed print from her mother. "I know I am," said Meg, admiring the silver folds of her furred silk dress, a gift from Mister Old Lawrence. Larry looked so excited that he could hardly contain himself. "Here's another present from the March family!" he cried. And there stood a tall man, muffled up to their eyeballs, supported by Mr. Brook. "Father!" the girls cried. In an instant, the house was in uproar. Mrs. March was half laughing, half crying. Joe almost fainted, and Amy fell on her father's feet and hugged her boots. When they had recovered themselves, Mr. March was settled in an easy chair, Beth on his lap, and Christmas dinner was served. The fat turkey was browned to perfection, and the plum pudding melted in their mouths. Old Mr. Lawrence and Laurie enjoyed them, along with John Brook, who kept sneaking admiring glances at at Meg. She blushed and smiled back. Joe spent most of the meal glowering at the unfortunate tutor, much to Laurie's amusement. They ate and drank and talked and laughed. The day ended with Beth playing carols and everyone singing. The following afternoon, Aunt March arrived to to her nephew and surprised 
John, Brooke, and Meg talking quietly together. Bless me! What's this? She cried, looking from the pale young man to her blushing niece. This is Laurie's tutor and father's friend, stammered Meg. John nodded shyly and vanished into the study. He's not thinking of proposing, I hope," boomed the young lady. "He's not nearly good enough for you. Why not?" Ape Meg demanded. Aunt March sniffed. "He's a poor wretch, and probably after the money, he thinks I'm leaving you in my will." Meg was so indignant that her voice soared louder than Aunt March's. "John's not like that." He's good and kind, which matters more than riches. In the study, John heard every word. His heart swelled with happiness. Perhaps Meg will marry me, even though I don't have any money. He thought. Hi, tea, tight tea," said Aunt March. "You'll soon tire of love in a cottage." I don't mind being poor," Meg replied firmly. "John and I work hard." We'll earn our way and be proud of it. As Aunt Mar stormed off in a huff, John raced from the study and took Meg in her arms. Not long after, Jo entered the drawing room to see her sister sitting on John's lap. Meg jumped up, but John smiled. "Congratulate us, Jo! We're engaged." Appalled at the thought of losing Meg, Jo raced upstairs and begged her parents to do something. But Mister and Missus March were thrilled at the news, and so were Amy and Beth. Even Laurie dashed around with an enormous bunch of flowers for them as soon as he heard. "What a year this has been," said Missus March. "But it's ended well." "Hmm," murmured Jo, not liking the thought of her family breaking up. Laurie knocked at her. "Cheer up," he said. "You always have me." Jo grinned. Don't you wish we could see into the future? Laurie said. No, said Joe, looking at her family. I might see something sad, and I don't believe any of us could be happier than we are this very minute. The end.